For 16 years, from 1989 through 2004, Book Notes was C-SPAN's signature author interview program. Focusing exclusively on contemporary nonfiction, the Book Notes series created an unparalleled television forum for writers of history, biography, politics, and public and cultural affairs. The Book Notes format was simple. One author, one book, one hour. For a full hour every Sunday night, 52 weeks a year, nonfiction writers were asked to discuss their most recent work. Beyond the book subject matter, authors were also queried about their research, their writing process, and their own lives and influences. The result is a body of televised interviews that serve as a lasting scholarly resource for authors, researchers, students, readers, and educators. George Mason University Libraries is now adding to this trove of information by re-interviewing selected authors about their experiences as part of the Book Notes series. Hello, I'm Lindsay Bestabrucci, oral historian for George Mason University Libraries, and with me is sound engineer Robert Vay. Today is Monday, September 29th, 2014, and we are recording from Fenwick Library, where we are speaking with author Robert Timberg, who appeared on Book Notes on August 27th, 1995, to discuss his book, The Nightingale Song. Hello, Mr. Timberg. Thank you for speaking with us today. Great hearing your voice, Lindsay. <laughs> Glad to do anything for Book Notes. So how did your book come to be on Book Notes? Uh, you know, that's, that's a mystery that uh, I can't solve. I, I think somehow my publisher got in touch with uh, Brian Lamb or Book Notes, or Book Notes got in touch with my publisher, but somehow, some way, somebody said to me one day, uh, you're going to be on Book Notes on such and such a date, and such and such a time, so make sure you're there. That's it. And how did you prepare for your appearance on the show? Uh, essentially, I didn't. Uh, particularly prepare. I, I had done um, a number of press events before that, though nothing as extensive. I had, you know, I had been on Good Morning America and I don't know one or two other things, but they were relatively short. And I knew this was going to be long. And the only thing I know about can remember about preparing is that I was more uptight than I usually am, and I don't know why it was, but I, it may have had something to do with the fact that I got there too early and was like 45 minutes before I was even supposed to be at the studio, and it was really hot out. And I remember walking around outside, smoking cigarettes for 45 minutes before I went in, and that, frankly, was my preparation. Well, what do you remember most from your appearance on Book Notes? I, I was surprised to find how much at ease I was and how comfortable I was answering Brian's questions. And I think that had a lot to do with Brian's questions and Brian's demeanor. He, 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 had, the, he had the skill that I always think of as crucial for a, a reporter in terms of asking questions. It doesn't matter what you, the reporter, says. What matters is what the person you're questioning says. And, you know, the, a good reporter will elicit interesting answers. And if the reporter doesn't have to do anything but blink his eyes and he gets an interesting answer out of it, that's all you need. And so, you know, Brian was anything but a showboat questioner. But he asked good questions, and then he let me answer. And uh, I, I think I think the answers turned out to be, uh, frankly, better than I ever thought they would have been. Well, you mentioned making the rounds at other shows, doing some of the morning shows. Book Notes' hour-long format differed greatly from most other network television interviews, which would last three minutes or less. What do you think are the benefits or drawbacks of this longer format for the author and for the viewer? I, I can't think of any any drawbacks. Um, I think, I, I, you know, I've just, you know, as before you 
you know, when you guys contacted me, I went back and, and looked at a video of my appearance on Book Notes back whenever that was, 1995 or whenever, and uh, and I was amazed at how I actually was able to explain things in, in a in a uh, in in what seemed to me to be a, a way that would make people understand what the heck I was trying to do in the Nightingale song. And it was, I, I just seemed much more at ease and frankly much more, uh, uh, geez, I can't even think of the word I'm looking for here. I, I just seemed to be able to explain things better than I ever thought I would be able to. You know, it just, it just came out right. Well, judging by the extensive marginalia in his books, Mr. Lamb read them very thoroughly before the interview. I'm actually sitting here with his copy of your book, um, which is very marked up. Do you find this to be normal for interviewers, and did it change the interview experience? I think, um, I, I don't think it was normal for interviewers, uh, you know, for those who are interviewing authors. In many cases, it, those, the people that are doing it are people that have talk shows. They don't, things are, you know, they have a million other things to do, and um, they really either don't have the time or the interest in reading a whole book. Uh, uh, interestingly, I find that they're not, they're actually pretty good at doing, uh, of faking it, if that's what it is, you know. But, what Brian was able to do was, you know, was to ask really perceptive questions, and and essentially trigger, uh, you know, interest. It seemed to me interesting responses for me, and you know, I I don't recall, you know, having the opportunity to talk at length uh, in any other forum as I did with book on book notes. Well, you've mentioned Brian Lamb's questions and his skill as an interviewer. Were you surprised by any of his questions? Uh, I, I, I wasn't. I, I was actually a little surprised that he asked uh, personal questions. I didn't mind it. I didn't resent it, but I didn't expect it either. And frankly, the questions that he asked particularly relating to my Marine Corps service, I think helped to to give perspective to, 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 to my book and what we were talking about. I, I think it was, I think they were, it was a good thing. Well, Mr. Lamb would also ask about an author's research and writing methods. Do you believe the reading public finds these details about the practice of writing interesting? You know, as far as the reading public is concerned, I really don't know. It seems to, it seems to me that I'm interested in that, but I'm not exactly the reading public, <laughs> and I, I think some would and some wouldn't. As far as another author, I think in general they would be fascinated by it. Did you watch book notes either before or after your own interview? And did your experience with the show change your impression of the program? I, I watched it a few times before and probably a few times after. Um, I think, no, I, I don't think it exactly changed my impression of the show because I always thought it was really good. But what I was really taken by was just how well prepared Brian was. I mean, it was just, you know, it was in a way kind of stunning. I mean, he had all the little points that, you know, that were, it seemed to me, worth raising. Well, the Book Note series focused entirely on nonfiction books published between the late 1980s and 2004. What do you think might be the advantages of an 800-book collection with this focus? 
Well, I would consider it really valuable, but uh, I'm not exactly uh, the average person. I'm not claiming to be an extraordinary person, but considering what I do, sure. and as a writer, I think it would be really worthwhile. And you know, it would be really interesting just to you know just to read through these things, not necessarily read the whole book, but you know, just see what Brian had marked. Uh, you know, I just think. It, it just would be a, I mean, book notes was really a special, a special program, and this is really, it was Brian's, Brian's efforts that made it special, and I think it sounds like these books with his, you know, his interlineations and everything are, you know, were crucial to all of that. So you know, if if you're interested in how something really important is done that's how you know take a look at these books that'll tell you well brian lamb had a rule that authors could only appear on the program one time if asked would you have returned for another interview sure <laughs> i mean in fact uh, they just changed the name of the show and i was on you know i did a interview with brian uh two weeks ago or something like that but that wasn't book notes I don't even I think that was what they call Q&A is that you found the loophole yeah okay. <laughs> right that's exactly it <laughs> well was there a difference in sales national attention or even critical reception for your book after you discussed it with Brian Lamb on book notes um, Lindsay I'm not really sure because I never, I never really kept track of of sales and things like that. I mean, I mean, considering that I had three kids in college during most of this period, you'd think I, I would have. But I, I mean, I think if suddenly it was on making all the bestseller lists, I would, you know, pay more attention. I was just happy that people seemed to be reading it, and people I cared about seemed to be reading it, and 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 I think. In the aftermath of my appearance on Book Notes, I, I, I believe uh, that those people were taking greater notice of the book. Did your experience with Brian Lamb and Book Notes cause you to rethink any of your own approaches or assumptions regarding your research or writing? Uh, no. Okay. What have you been working on since this book, and which works are you most pleased with? Well, since um, since this interview, which was in 1995, I've since written two other books. One was called uh, State of Grace, a memoir of Twilight Time, which was which which was a book about an old Sandlot football team I played with before I went to the Naval Academy. And, I, and this was all took place in the late 50s. And in a way, I used it as kind of a metaphor for essentially the, the, the nation as the cloud of Vietnam was gathering over the nation. And uh, the other book just came out. It's called Blue-Eyed Boy, which is a post-Vietnam memoir which starts the day I was wounded in 1967 and follows me um, through numerous hospital time and surgeries and kind of learning to be a reporter and taking me through the writing of the Nightingale song and up to now, as a matter of fact. But that book is, just came out about three weeks ago. You know, there's one thing that I, I know there's no way we can go back and change this, but I think in in um, in the book notes interview, I got some dates wrong, if you can believe that. Uh, I, I, I went to Vietnam. I landed in Vietnam in 1966. I was wounded in January of 1967, and I think I had both those things a year later than that so as I say that's 
not Brian's fault. It's not anybody's fault but mine. And I doubt there's anything you can do to correct it, but so it goes. I'm surprised he didn't catch you on that. Yeah. Right. Because he's a, he does his... He does his homework. I'm surprised he didn't say you got that wrong. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you know, on the other hand, I wrote it and I got it wrong. Oh, okay. I thought maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wasn't well, Brian? It was me. <laughs> well, in your estimation, what has been the lasting impact of book notes, either in then contemporary American society or since? Well, you know, I'm I'm weary of. Uh, you know, sweeping judgments. But one thing that I think has happened, and I think Book Notes probably was the uh, trigger for it, is that I noticed a number of different organizations, particularly bookstores, are now videotaping their those that have author have authors come and speak are videotaping those those talks and then making them available on their website uh, for example in uh, uh, in early August I spoke at the Politics and Prose bookstore in Washington and um, they videotaped it and, and and you can actually go and see it on, on their web, website I mean it's and I think others are doing the same thing and I think that's I think that's a pretty valuable uh, about a very valuable resource, uh, and and I think you know that that book notes was the was the pioneer pioneered that. Great. Well, is there anything else that you would like to add regarding the book notes program, C-SPAN, or Brian Lamb? Uh, well. You know, I, I was most of my life I've been a reporter or an editor, and much of it in Washington. And I have to say that C-SPAN came in handy, God knows how many times. I mean, it, for for reporters, it's just an enormous resource. As for book notes and Brian, it was just. It was just a wonderful experience. It, it started out with me, as I say, being nervous and sweaty, smoking cigarettes outside for 45 minutes. And it turned out to be one of the most pleasant professional things I've ever done. And and I have to say, you know, I, I don't ex I'm not exactly a buddy of Brian's, but I do, you know, I'm really happy that I met that I've met him and had a chance to have exchanges with him, even if they were mostly on television. You know, Brian is one of those special people. Well, Mr. Tibberg, we want to thank you for participating in the Book Notes Oral History Project. We appreciate your time and your insight. Hey, thank you. That's been, it, it was my, my pleasure.